So in our previous uh, case, we we uh, uh, developed the isoparametric solution, which is uh, how we extremize a functional subject to uh, an, uh, an integral constraint. So I want to give an example of that uh, here today. So let's have, for our given, we're going to consider a collection of non-intersecting curves uh, having some given length L. So if we're drawing that, uh, let's let's go ahead and give ourselves an axis here, and then uh, here's our our x-axis. Okay, so there's x, uh, and let's go from let's say negative a up to a, and let's say this is here's our curve. It looks however you want it to look, something like this. We'll call this curve u of x. Okay. And our goal is to find, uh, we're going to find the curve uh, for which the area enclosed by the curve uh, and the x-axis from negative a to a uh, is a maximum. Okay, so how do we find that? Here's our solution. First, let's go ahead and just write the area that's enclosed by any given curve u which we'll just call it i of u uh, is equal to the integral now in this case from negative a to a of u of x dx, right? That's pretty straightforward. Call that equation one. Okay, we have that constraint, right? That uh, whatever, uh, whatever solution of u we choose, it has to have a length l. So let's go ahead and write uh, that uh, constraint equation. So uh, in this case, we'll say the total length uh, of the curve is given by, and we'll call this j of u since it's another uh, um, functional. So j of u, again, is the integral from negative a to a. And if you remember back when we, we went uh, through how to compute the, the length uh, along a curve, we ended up with a, um, the quantity 1 plus u prime squared uh, to the one half dx, and that's going to have to equal a constant l. Okay, that's equation two. If you don't remember how we got that, uh, just go back to the uh, the you know back quite a few lectures where we did the example problem of proving that the shortest distance between two paths is a straight line. That's where we derived that. So now let's go ahead and proceed uh, using the method that we had developed. Uh, to, to solve the isoparametric problem. And if you remember, we what we want to do is write a modified functional that we want to extremize. So we're going to use equation 1 and 2. Uh, we're going to write the modified functional to be extremized as follows. In this case, we'll call it just I star of u. And that will be equal to integral from negative a to a of the quantity we take that uh, integrand of, of i, which is just u in this case, and then we add uh, the, the integrand of the constraint equation uh, with multiply by Lagrange multiplier lambda, 1 plus u prime, the quantity squared, the 1 half, close our brackets, dx, right? So that's that's the uh, modified functional that we want to extremize. We'll call that equation three. So what we observe now is we look at equation three and we see that that's uh, just a functional uh, of the form uh, uh, f star, where the, where the integrand is f star of x, u, and u prime, okay? And we know the Euler-Lagrange equation for that. We've already derived it. So the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, for an integrand of the form, the form, let's say in this case, it's f star of x, u, and u prime, uh, is given by partial f star, right, with respect to u minus d by dx, partial f star with respect to u prime. That's going to be equal to zero. That's the Euler-Lagrange equation. We'll call this equation four. 
Okay, so we can go ahead now looking at this uh, this integrand in equation three, that being f star. Uh, let's go ahead and, and carry out uh, the partial di uh, differentiation and say where a partial of f star with respect to u, though looking at that, that's pretty easy. The partial of f star with respect to u is just one. And we can say that the partial of f star with respect to u prime uh, is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, that looks like lambda over 2 times 1 plus u prime, the quantity squared, now to the negative 1 half, we're just using the chain rule here, times 2 u prime, okay, and then just doing a little algebraic simplification, uh, let's see, the 2's cancel out, we have lambda u prime in our numerator, and in the denominator, we have 1 plus u prime quantity squared to the 1 half. And let's just go ahead and collectively call these equations, equation 5. So we're going to substitute equations 5 into equation 4. And we're going to end up with the uh, 1 minus d by dx uh, lambda u prime over 1 plus u prime the quantity squared to the 1 half make sure this gets all over there okay that equals 0 all right this is equation 6 okay i can um, uh, bring the bring this quantity to one side or the other and leave the one on the other side and integrate it directly. So integrating six directly gives the following. We end up with lambda u prime divided by one plus u prime squared to the one half is equal to now x minus c1. Okay, I could have said x plus c1, but I know where I'm going. It's going to be a little easier to recognize the solution if we use a minus sign here. Okay, so this will be equation 7. So now I, now I have the differential equation. Now I just need to develop a solution. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to square equation 7, and I'm going to rearrange it to isolate u prime. Okay, okay. when I do that, I end up with... Um, u prime, the quantity squared, uh, is going to be equal to, our numerator here is going to be x minus c1 squared, divided by lambda squared minus x minus c1 squared. Okay, let's call that equation 8. Okay, taking the square root of equation 8, gives me an equation for u prime that looks like uh, u prime, which I'll remind you is equal to du dx, uh, and that's going to be equal to plus or minus, um, this numerator now just becomes x minus c1, the denominator becomes lambda squared minus x minus c1 squared, but now we have to take that to the square root of the one-half power, okay? Let's call that equation 9. Okay, now I can, equi uh, I can integrate equation 9 directly uh, to get the following. So the left-hand side just becomes u of x now. The right-hand side is going to be plus or minus lambda squared minus x minus c1, the quantity squared, plus c2. Let's call that equation 10. Now I'm going to subtract c2 from both sides and square. Okay, when I do that, I end up with uh, u minus c2, the quantity squared. Um, I'm just rearranging a little, plus x minus c1, the quantity squared, is equal to lambda squared. Let's call that equation 11. Okay, so what is equation 11? Well, 
You can observe pretty easily that equation 11 represents the equation of a circle. And that circle is going to be centered at uh, C1, C2 with some radius lambda. Remember uh, when we developed the Lagrange multiplier method, I mentioned that uh, frequently in problems of applied math or physics, the Lagrange multiplier lambda takes on physical significance. In this case, it takes on the value of the radius of that circle. So now the question becomes, uh, what, how do we determine the constant? So let me give you some brief remarks. Okay, number one. The constants C1, C2, and lambda are determined as follows. Okay, number one, the boundary conditions, or the boundary points, right? So we know that u at negative a equals zero. We also know that u at a equals zero, right? And then that gives, so we have two equations, and now we have three unknowns. That third um, unknown is solved for by uh, enforcing our constraint equation. Right, which was integral from negative a to a of 1 plus u prime, the quantity squared, to the 1 half dx equals l. That's our third equation. So using these three, uh, 1, 2, 3 equations, we can solve for c1, c2, and lambda. Okay, let's suppose though now, let's suppose that the Euler-Lagrange equation yields the following result. Let's suppose that our solution, so here's our axis again. So there's x, there's a, there's negative a. Let's suppose that it, it looks something like this, right? So this is a circle. Um, what do you see as a problem here? Well, you see that um, in, in this case, and you could even see it from equation 11, but the solution for u is no longer a single valued function of x. Okay, this is still the correct solution. Okay, but, but we need further discussion. And that discussion is going to come, uh, in a couple sections ahead when we talk about, uh, parametric representations.